Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. My name is Matilda McQuaid, and I'm one of the co-curators for the Cooper Hewitt um, Design Triennial. And I'm happy today to officially, the exhibition is open. Um, and it was co-organized or co-curated um, by myself and Caitlin Condell and Andrea Lips and co-organized with the Cube Design Museum in the Netherlands. So believe it or not, they have the exact same show, almost, um, opening on the same day today. Um, so if you're in Europe, I would um, take a stop at Cube in Kerkrod in the Netherlands, um, which I'm curious, I'm going next week, I'm curious to see what their interpretation of um, all the projects is. So. Um, Today on the opening, we want to celebrate the designers that are featured. So this is the last of these salons that we've had today. Um, we're bringing them together for discussion and exploration of the themes which are explored in the exhibition, as well as in their work. Um, and I think all of the designers that we that are in the show and also represented um, in these salons are highly interdisciplinary. So they're not just architects and just designers or graphic designers. They are have many other interests and collaborate with many other people. So the exhibition Nature seeks to inspire ideas, collaboration, and dialogue to address some of the most significant and consequential environmental and humanitarian issues of our time. So we hope to be doing that here today. And um, I think these series of salons has been an incredible um, opportunity for um, many known as well as unknown designers to speak. So it's my pleasure to introduce, I'm hoping it's going to be four, right? Oh, yes, good, okay. Um, four architects. Um, so the first two um, represent um, Ensemble Studio. And um, if you have seen the incredible monumental installation of the garden called Petrified River. That is by the architects um, in Ensemble Studio. Um, and the principals are Antone Garcia Abril and Deborah Mesa. And I'm just going to read their bio because it's, it's really interesting in, in, in both cases. Um, Ensemble Studio is a cross-functional team founded in 2000 and led by architects Anton and Deborah. They balance um, imagination and reality, art and science. Their work innovates typologies, technologies, and methodologies to address issues as diverse as the construction of the landscape or the prefabrication of the house. Anton and Deborah are committed to sharing ideas and cultivati cultivating synergies between professional and academic worlds through teaching, lecturing, and researching. She is ventil then Tulet Chair in Architectural Design at Georgia Tech, and Anton is a professor at MIT where they had co-founded the POP Lab, standing, st stands for Prototypes of Prefabrication, in 2012. Now they're about to complete Ensemble Fabrica, the Madrid-based counterpart of the POP Lab, a fabrication laboratory that can take their investigations even further. Petrified River for Cooper Hewitt is the first work created in this new space. So it was created in Madrid and then um, shipped to New York City. Cave. Um, Kabaya, and please, you're going to have to correct me because I, I wanted to ask you before I came up here. Kabaya Karanja? Kabaye Karanja. Karanja. And Stella Mutegi? Okay. Um, Cave Bureau is a Nairobi-based practice founded in 2014 by Kabaya and Stella. They describe themselves as explorers of architecture and urbanism within nature. Their work addresses the anthropological and geological context of the African city as a means to confront the challenges of contemporary rural and urban life. The Bureau aims to develop systems and structures that improve the human condition, without negatively impacting the natural environment. In this regard, CAVE navigates a return to the limitless curiosity of our early ancestors, conducting playful and intensive research studies into caves within and around Nairobi. These studies form part of a broader decoding of pre- and post-colonial conditions of the city, 
explored through drawing, storytelling, construction, and the curation of performative events. So I want to welcome Ensemble Studio, followed by Cave Bureau, and then we will have a discussion up front after Cave speaks. Thank you. Let's see how we can share the mic. <laughs> Thank you, Matilda, for the invitation to this salon, to the exhibition, and all the team at Cooper Hewitt. Thank you for all of you coming. Um, and I hope you got the chance to go in the garden and, uh, and check the, our work there. Let's see. Uh, as Matilda was saying, uh, in Ensemble Studio, our work transcends uh, disciplines, uh, programs, uh, scales. Uh, our team is based in Madrid and Boston, and for us, we uh, design the process uh, as much as we care for the final outcome. And actually, looking at processes of transformation of the landscapes, looking at processes of extracting materials has always been a great source of inspiration and, uh, and of course, of uh, acquiring a way of acquiring a knowledge and certainly in the first works or visits to the quarries in Galicia where these images uh, come from uh, were um, absolutely key for a way of looking at how our actions as architects impact um, uh, the landscapes from where the materials are extracted you know? and, uh, and therefore caring very much about not taking for granted what is given, but really rethinking many times the processes. In this work, for example, we were recycling a spare material uh, uh, of the quarry to create a structural and sculptural uh, facade that then we transported to the site. And, uh, and this is uh, our, our first, uh, I would say, experiment uh, of, uh, of the language that we have developed for the Petrified River. This is our first, um, uh, uh, I would say, project that tries to comprehend and subdue to the rules and the messages of how to build with nature and in nature. We called it the, the truffle as a parasite, and we used available materials uh, given from the mineral world, the soil, the, the, the branches, uh, all that dirt that uh, configured a ball of conglomerated mass, a petrified, almost a synthetic stone uh, that truffled, uh, somehow uh, defied a lot of architectural canons of form, space, uh, or tectonics. No? We just tried to emulate uh, the, the, the processes of, of nature in its geologies and try to understand this as an opportunity to develop an architectonical language that could be mimetic and could be uh, sensible to uh, what uh, the landscape was giving us. Um, this was a decade ago uh, as a small cabanon and uh, remained uh, a little bit dormant until we got the call of, uh, of Peter and Kathy, who actually sponsored uh, 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 our work in Montana and also helped us to build the Petrified River. And they invited us to this beautiful landscape that Deborah is to, will try to... to yes, so, so the commission here was to create an art center in, uh, in Montana. Uh, in the middle of a uh, very wild, rough, undeveloped uh, place, uh, absolutely new to us. And so our effort here was how to read the landscape, how to operate with the rules of the landscape more than impose pre-established orders uh, into it. No? We even decided to create this art center instead of doing one building one white box that didn't relate to the site to explode the center into a constellation of spaces that would connect 
visitors to the landscape. No? And here we are in the studio brainstorming, working with our hands, trying to understand uh, how geology operates, how the landscape uh, transforms and morphs uh, to build an architecture that could uh, uh, learn from those, uh, those actions. No? How could we build a space through erosion, through fragmentation, through explosion? Uh, through crystallization, and we we created through these process different uh, spaces that would fit um, in different spots of this landscape and would create uh, shelters and uh, spaces where the art program could uh, happen in total connection with uh, this landscape. No, and then um, these moments, these. Um, uh, actions making the models where became kind of rehearsals of how we would operate on the site uh, where we were at the mercy of the weather the elements and uh, and where the collaboration with the local uh, people was critical to make these uh, structures of landscape as we call them uh, happen no? and we were controlling some variables like uh, thermal properties acoustic properties but other variables uh, um, were left a bit undetermined. No? So this exercise was also about relinquishing control, not needing to uh, control absolutely all the elements of the final uh, uh, product, the final architecture, which came out also a bit of a, as a surprise. No? And, uh, and uh, in a way, we unearth these, uh, these uh, structures, and, uh, and there are some things like the scale, and uh, some of the properties that, uh, that we knew would be there, but others like, for example, how these uh, structures sound finally um, are, are a discovery you know, for us. And they become um, places to host music concerts, but they become instruments also themselves that are able to project the sound into uh, the landscape. You know? And they become these hybrid um, structures that can be read as art, as a geology or as architecture uh, indistinctly, which takes us to uh, New York City and our proposal for Cooper Hewitt, this uh, petrified river that also tries to uh, interpret the, um, the landscape of Manhattan in its origin. And uh, yeah, we, we all have to remember that before we arrived here, there was a, uh, uh, a wild ecosystem no? full of rivers, ponds, creeks, and uh, hills. No? Manhattan is a place for many hills. No? So when we had to think of, of a site-specific action over the garden in front of, of Central Park in this beautiful kind of canvas of... of, 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 uh, of uh, of, uh, mm, of landscape uh, framed in, 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 into the grid of, of Manhattan, we, we always thought that we should revive that uh, almost natura morta no? of, of, uh, of the previous nature of Manhattan. So the, the idea of, of making an abstract composition, uh, composition that could recreate conceptually and almost, I would say, spiritually, the, the, the idea of a previous existing nature took us to the, to the paradoxical uh, decision to, to prefabricate a river. And here comes the mix, uh, technological and artistical uh, parts that we have been producing through Ensemble Studio, no? this encounter between architecture, civil engineering, and art to, uh, to, uh, to create this, this uh, kind of narrative, to give life to, to, to this, um, I would say, soulless material, the concrete. No? So these were the, the first prototypes of this petrified river, this conglomerate of, of concrete soil, pigments, uh, uh, and terrain that that morphologically was um, uh, broken into into uh, into the magmatic condition of the flow of concrete as if it was a river, no? a river that is stiff and structurally resistant as a beam, right? 
and engineered as a, as a 40 feet spanning beam that weighs 20 ton and had to be uh, strictly and precisely engineered according to the prefabrication standards, perfectly cut into pieces to be capable as an as an uh, geological Ulysses to, to, to travel and to, and to be compacted and delivered uh, using the logistics of, 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 of contemporary transportation. So we were transporting and delivering like a landscaped Amazon, a river, a pond, and a, and a hill. Uh, and all this kind of um, uh, delirious uh, action uh, uh, ended up in a, in a in an incredible maneuver where we cut Fifth Avenue for six hours uh, and we were escorted by policemen and, and uh, a crew of dedicated uh, uh, technicians and, and, uh, and people from the museum and, and the curatorial team and, and, and somebody, everybody, we orchestrated a very, uh, I would say, audacious um, civil engineering maneuver uh, uh, flying rivers among Fifth Avenue and crossing them in, in giratorial uh, uh, rotation through through the streets, and putting together two parts of a pond that each of them weighed like uh, two parts of a nutshell, uh, uh, around 10 tons each. So all this kind of human effort, all this bravery, and all this uh, artistic sublime uh, desire eh, ended up into a natural composition that when I see it on the garden I always think it looks like it has been always been there no I mean we should talk to the to the curators and let it here I mean we don't need to move it again and redo <laughs> all the process and all the effort and all these uh, um, uh, uh, um, nerves eh? so I mean all this is to recreate um, uh, a very human uh, um, performance no, of, of how we interact, how we force nature into our own needs. No? Uh, the same way Manhattan was turned into an abstract grid of beautiful buildings and infrastructure and life that we all love and hate, and hate yeah? <laughs> mostly if you live in Massachusetts. Yeah? And, uh, and all these kind of uh, emotions that turned uh, the the natural into an urban, uh, where to serve uh, our, our desires and our needs. And this piece somehow tries to condensate all that, all that um, sentiment, all that uh, uh, emotion, yeah? and all that uh, uh, logic that uh, make it uh, possible. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> it's good to be here all the way from uh, Nairobi, which is in Kenya, which is in East Africa. <laughs> um, we'll start briefly with um, just introducing who we are as CAVE. Uh, and then just jump into our uh, presentation on the Anthropocene Museum. Um, CAVE uh, was founded in 2014. Um, we worked together with Kabaga in a big architectural firm in uh, Nairobi. He likes to say we were fired, but <laughs> I like to say we were la um, laid off. I was laid off. I don't know about <laughs> I don't know about Kabage, but I was laid off, and maybe he was fired. But the same day, <laughs> um, on the same day. Um, but anyway, the truth is they they were going through financial problems, so they let a bunch of people uh, leave and. We happened to be in that bunch that was let go. Uh, that was in 2014, around May. Uh, no, uh, February, March. Uh, we went our own ways. Um, and then in September, we spoke 
and we started CAVE. Um, and it's been a short journey, a short, intense journey so far. Um, and this is, you know, uh, the intensity of it all. Here we are in New York, so <laughs> um, we're glad to be here. We are a small um, architectural firm, obviously based in Nairobi. We um, have an ethos of how we run um, the project. This is the whole team there. Um, we like to take quirky photographs every year. So if you follow us on Instagram or look at our um, uh, website once in a while, our photos change. And one of the things CAVE is about is um, where architecture started. Um, and the name itself is actually where architecture did start with early man. They didn't have buildings. They used caves as um, shelter. So that's the origin of, um, of architecture, really. Uh, so we ran it. The two of us, they are looking like tribal chiefs or <laughs> something. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we ran this. We were three uh, founders of CAVE, but um, one of the founders left because he followed another path. So Kabagi and I have been left to run the ship. So far, I would say so good, but very tough. We are still sort of in the startup space. So that's been interesting, <laughs> interesting, I would say, when um, we had a salary and then now sometimes we don't. But uh, <laughs> I guess that's the nature of, um, of startups. And just to jump into some of the um, things we are about as CAVE, um, we have a manifesto in which we try and run all the projects that we get in that sort of um, framework of the manifesto. And in that manifesto, really, what we talk about is um, three things that we have uh, placed uh, projects in, depending on where they are and what they are about. The three uh, things that we talk about is, we call them the origin, um, the void, and the maid. Uh, the origin is where you come from. And just based in um, Nairobi, Kenya, as you all know or may not know, we were a colonial, um, we were a British colony, and we gained our independence in 1963. And that is about the age our parents were just becoming um, teenagers, finishing university, and moving out of home. And what a lot of people who are now in their 60s, 70s did was they left their rural homes and went into urban places to go to higher education and to work. And the origin we call is where they have come from. And then they go to the void. The void is the cities. And in the cities we have um, a lot of people who still come, um, even to this day, from the rural area and come and live in informal settlements. What uh, they are trying to do is get a better life for themselves. And when they're in this void, um, they are trying to work so hard to make it out of the void, to go into the maid. And the maid is now, I guess, sort of the people who live on the street that this museum is on. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that's almost everybody's inspiration to be able to um, live such a life. So a lot of the people in the void are struggling and working so hard to get out of this void to the maid. And what's funny then is that the people who are in the maid um, now want to leave the maid space because they now 
have their big houses on big acreage and drive big cars and all that. They now want to leave because there's now too many people who've come into the city and they're all competing for the same resources. And the people in the maid now want to go back to the origin. <laughs> and that's been happening quite a lot, um, that people are now leaving the cities and they're now going out back into the rural space to, to um, live a better quality of life. It's um, funny because there's still people in the origin coming into the city to be in this big void, to try and get into the maid, and then from the maid <laughs> back to the origin. So in that whole space, we try and um, when we get um, projects, and you know, we categorize them into, is this a void, is this an origin, and is this uh, a, a maid? And then try and address the reasons why people are moving from either one of these spaces. And can we address those issues um, in what we give to them as the end product so that you're not trying to jump around all these places? Because in all these spaces, I think we can still get quality um, and be satisfied with where you are. You're not all trying to move about. Um, and one of the projects then that we have is what we have presented to the museum. And I'll just let uh, Kabage talk a bit about that. Thank you, Stella. So my task this evening is to introduce the Anthropocene project. Before I do that, just to lighten up the room a bit. <laughs> I don't know if it's just me feeling tense here. Um, <laughs> probably is. Um, so we, we brought a bit of an artifact from Nairobi, well, specifically the Rift Valley, and it's, it's obsidian. And what we want to do is offer it up to a, as a gift to one audience member who will ask the most interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> the judge for that. Uh, we'll leave it to Cooper Hewitt, if you don't mind. You can judge that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's a bit of... It's as close as you get to dragon glass. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's see how it goes. Um, so, begin this quotation, or rather this presentation with a quote from a relatively controversial but extremely influential philosopher, Martin Heidegger, who coined... Uh, the term and said, we only begin to understand technology when we cease to notice it. I think you could flip it and bring in architecture in between there. And <laughs> we're not the first to do it. I mean, it's been done before that replacement of technology with architecture. And for the longest history, I mean, technology was not just something you hold. It was a window, it was you know, a flooring, how you do your flooring, and it, it was quite, quite straightforward to do with how we progress as mankind. So in a way, what's interesting, at least what we've taken out from this is, Martin Heidegger had an interesting perspective of technology, a view of technology as being a reflection of who we are, just sort of um, my perspective of it where we look at the things we've created, the materials and energies we've extracted from the world as actually being us, a reflection of who we are, and quite problematic in many senses. But what's interesting in this age and time, which is the Anthropocene, as it's been proposed, should we say, it's, it's quite, quite seismic to reflect on how much impact we've had on the world. And in a way, our project sort of begins with that. This, as many might know, is, well, what should we say, was, in 1945, a nuclear test, the Trinity Project. 
And this is one of the sort of signals to do with um, our impact as humans on the world. Flipping it entirely, looking at it from the African perspective. This is a clip from a video during a struggle of post, for post, um, struggle for independence, should we say, in Nairobi and Kenya in general. And these are people who would hide in caves uh, to struggle and fight for independence. And it was around about the same period, should we say, when um, colonialism was extracting so much from the continent as well as other continents. And caves were being used to be that point of resistance. If we look at the Anthropocene, um, it's quite a technical um, term, should we say, a technical investigation. It began, should we say, um, and described first coined by Paul Crutzen and Eugene Stormer, who defined it. This slide, quite simply, is a chronostratigraphic, sorry, I always have a hard time describing that or rather pronouncing it, chronostratigraphic <laughs> chart. And it's basically defines the age uh, we are in, and should we say the geological stage uh, that we find ourselves in. The Anthropocene is not a, should we say, it has not been ratified yet. And it's something that is yet to be um, identified formally within the whole chart. Repetition is the consideration of the past not as a static event, nor as a chronologically fixed date which we can bring to our own age by mere visual or formal invocation, but of searching the possibility that would have been in the creative work of our ancestors. Araya Agdendom. Now, again, there's a reference back to Martin Heidegger here where he looked at our past and futures. And what we're trying to do with this project is trying to bring the two together, our histories as well as the present, and specifically looking at our habitation of caves. Now what we have here is, is a bit of a, a chart and description of the position and time in space that we find ourselves to do with the Anthropocene as a proposed time and epoch. And as you can notice here, 1950 and 1945 to 1950 is the proposed period when that should actually commence. Seems like the image got slightly corrupted, but hopefully it makes sense. So what we've basically done, we've overlaid obviously the Trinity uh, project and the cave and specifically during the Mau Mau uprising. If you don't know, Mau Mau are basically the freedom fighters, uh, sorry, the freedom fighters who assisted us to gain our independence. And this cave which we've exhibited at the museum is one such cave that was inhabited by the Mau Mau. And for us, in many respects, we, unfortunately, we don't take it as, as a museum, but in many ways it is, and it should be read as such. And so what we did was to survey it uh, using point cloud technology to actually analyze each and every space, each and every surface, 3D print it, and effectively model and cast it in bronze to actually represent the museum as it is. So if, if you don't mind, I'll just go into some, some poetic narrative. It's not very sophisticated, but hopefully it'll make sense. So we read the origin as one 
a singularity of architecture and nature when it all began. See the baboon parliament in its true stature, flowing through lava tubes fashioned in power caldera. Of steam and struggle, we draw here to scramble for an Africa in architecture built on protest and geothermal. The Mbai cave is ready for visitors as we point in cloud against a mapping the settlers chose to obscure and shroud. It was a Stone Age cave filled with obsidian tools and not too long ago, a refuge against those dreaded colonial rules. Opening falls, watered doors, and a nave with burnt up mow walls. So we unlocked the double helix on the left side to see it in chromosome. Mighty sections etched on leather hide of zebu cow grown. Now see the incline to an epoch we, narrati we natives resisted in spiritual space, shaping being and time. So on the right, you see the museum and its repository. We trace it on contours of dormant drawings showing volcanoes and lava tubes, a pent up geology. So what we did was to draw it in scale and built to shell. Tracing habitation that shaped this uh, abstract nation gel. The red spots, as you can see, mark habitation of the Mau Mau's at different points of the struggle. So, so much for this struggle and so much for these glorious journals, not much for the depository. When it isn't architecture we look at, but ourselves, an obsessed, putrid technology. So we have a short film that's playing in the, in the gallery. It's online and we hope we can actually get to see it. So we had three characters, one Jiro, and we have this young boy, this herdsman, Sirma, and an artist, Jack. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Amazing presentations. And um, it's funny when I was, um, when we were curating the show, we didn't absolutely know what we were going to include um, and also receive um, from our designers. And um, specifically, I know we had a lot of back and forth with um, CAVE about what they were going to present. We kind of knew with you. But, um, uh, what was interesting is when we finally kind of installed to see the model of Petrified River and to see the cave right across from each other. And it was like, wow, this is, um, it couldn't have been planned <laughs> and it wasn't planned. Um, but it was just amazing in terms of the similarities, but yet the kind of, uh, the, the methodology getting there is completely, it's very different. But what I loved is um, spatially how you, you each treat space, um, whereas the void becomes a um, you know, uh, very important part of your work. And I'm talking about the void not as part of the manifesto, but as kind of a spatial quality. And where the solid becomes you know, a very important part of certainly your work and sort of that placing the solid in space. And I'm just as architects, you know, we're always talking about, or I'm not an architect, but you're always talking about space. Um, so I'm just curious, like how, um, you know, what your thoughts are about sort of space, how you 
work in space, um, specifically, you know, with those two projects. And I mean, I'm dying to know more sort of how you decided on a cave as your kind of source for both your name and your kind of what you do. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable. So dive in. <laughs> so can you hear me? Yeah. I think for us, the cave was quite, uh, quite an obvious choice. Having at least, at least both Stella and I were probably the first of our family to have studied abroad. And we came back home um, by our choice. We could have stayed abroad, but with a very reflective perspective of, of architecture and what it can be, and that you can actually question what architecture is. And so for us, we began to look back at our history to think about, okay, what, what did we hold on to? What did our ancestors really hold on to? And in more recent times, you're talking about the 1960s, we had the Mao Mao freedom fighters actually using caves as a space to hold resistance and, and actually find communion together as a community. So we, we realized yeah, there's a lot of value here. Let's just try to unpick it and look into a bit more detail. So we use technology to sort of unravel a space that's formed by lava. So they're lava tube caves. And what you're seeing, I mean, what it took us aback, to be honest, because that's the first time we're seeing that cave or seeing the void of it. Because when you're in it, you can't perceive it at all. So, yeah, it's quite important for us, in a way, yeah. But in terms of the in terms of the space inside, yeah. I know you've you've um, done what GPS not GPS, but what do you call it the, the cloud point cloud yeah. scanning yeah scanning it. Um, are you thinking kind of again going back to this the question about space? Are you thinking about because you mapped where they lived, the freedom fighters um, sort of took shelter, um, lived, slept. Are you mapping those out as kind of um, as you would program a building, in a sense, um, do you see it in that kind of um, in that kind of way? I think it, it's reading of program, definitely. But the fact that there wasn't very much uh, documented, mm -hmm. there's a lot to read into it. There are parts of walls where you'd have fires that are burnt, and you see the, the sort of blackened walls. Mm -hmm. Um, there were areas which were smoothened out where they would sleep, and it sort of over time the, the rock started to smoothen out. Um, and so we, we are just beginning to get into that, but there's a lot to read from it because it's, it's a history, a very complicated history, a lot of which was also partly erased and is problematic for us to remember, mm -hmm. or at least very accurately. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting. An interesting question, actually, yeah. And in terms of ensemble, I mean, here you create something that looks, I mean, it's completely artificial, but it looks like it's been, you know, around for millennia. And, um, and what was the inspiration for that? I mean, was it the landscape? Was it nature itself? Or was it um, something else that kind of got you started? Um, I, <clears throat> I think that what we share with, with our cave colleagues is that um, by intuition, mm -hmm. we are not looking to disciplinary architecture or technologies to, to get inspiration or vocation. I would still think that the, the manantial, the source, comes from, from the correct interpretation of, of landscape, a contemporary interpretation. That means that we can still use the, the technologies that we have available, could be 3D scanning, laser scanning, mapping, or civil engineering, or finite uh, structural design, to uh, make this decoding, because the source is still the same. Mm -hmm. So I think this, um, this uh, approach to the natural 
as a as a still a mystery, as an unexplored territory that requires every I would say every generation, not even every uh, era, no, it has to reinterpret that decode again, almost starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. It's something that uh, in in architecture is is going on. No? Um, 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 I think we're not alone in this research, and uh, and the more the better, yeah? because there are like this kind of a citizen Kane scenario. No, there's everyone's looking for a different perspective, mm -hmm. but I think with that we're pretty much looking to the same place, mm -hmm. uh, and these are the 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 challenges of of our of our uh, time. No? Uh, some of some people call them environmental, others call them energetic or energy-based, others call, call them how to process our residues and res I mean, it's pretty much the same, what we're talking about. We just have to tackle it in, in, a, in a different perspective. And architecture has a lot, no? mm -hmm. uh, from, uh, from taking, I would say, in, Inspiration in the in the in the object trouvé as a cave or as a or as a landscape, you know, that that really could be transformed into that origin that uh, cave explains so beautifully, to uh, to a to a complete um, reinterpretation or transformation of the of the language of architecture, you no. Know? Um, Escaping a little bit of the, our systemic methodologies to our kind of academia that have uh, ruled how we design uh, for, well, for a long time. No? So I think this this might be the, the confluences rather than the differences. And interestingly enough, uh, in the in the projects that you, we showed, like the truffle or the projects in Montana. Uh, where the Petrified River is a continuation no, of that research. But without uh, being an intention, we ended up building uh, kind of caves, no, or cave-like spaces as these shelters in the landscape, mm -hmm. no, trying to follow or read the landscape, the canyons, no, the, the topography, and the, all the uh, kind of geological uh, characteristics. We ended up creating, um, of course, with an artificial material, mixing it with the soils and the and the stones, etc. But the the kind of given a form relates, no, with this idea of the cave as a very primary um, form of architecture. No, that uh, no matter uh, whether you're an architect or or not, but I think we all as humans uh, relate to in a in a way. No, we feel connected with. Uh, understanding where it comes from or not, uh, we read it as a, as a kind of shelter or architecture. No, I think in both of your works, um, there's this really emotional and visceral response, you know, to it. Um, going, I'm sure, going into a cave or going underneath the domo or um, Beartooth portal. I mean, there's just this um, immense kind of feeling of connection with nature. And so I'm curious in terms of you know, nature itself. I mean, do you think there's um, sort of a, a shift happening? I mean, in architecture, I mean, we're seeing it somewhat in design where there, I mean, this was one of the kind of um, observations in the exhibition is that we're seeing many more collaborations happening between designers and other disciplines um, because of, you know, the situation that we're in in terms of the environmental and ecological situation. But I'm just curious if you see that in architecture specifically, that um, architects are feeling and wanting to connect more with nature and, um, and how that's sort of affecting kind of the process in which you um, are working with, um, you know, in architecture and you know, ultimately what the, the outcome is. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that, um, especially in the US, mm -hmm. there is a tendency to detach the architect from, um, 
from the construction no, and the mm -hmm. outcome in, and even the making of things, no, because uh, there's a tendency to divide everything into uh, parcels and liabilities mm -hmm. and, no, and mm -hmm. you get all these different players who have a very specific responsibility and they don't speak to uh, each other. And I, I do think that um, you know, as architects and as uh, citizens, as human beings, uh, especially knowing what the impact of our actions are, um, you know, we, we, we need to, to fight against mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. no? because mm -hmm. we need to, um, to have uh, uh, more responsibility and, and more uh, capacity to decide uh, on, on how things play out. No? And, uh, and therefore be able to instigate change. No? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we are fighting against uh, uh, the current. Yeah. I mean, in terms of Kenya, do you feel like it's really siloed, sort of what Deborah was saying? Or do you, is, there, is there kind of a hands-on, um, sort of um, more hands-on experience with, um, you know, in architecture? Um, I think there's a lot of architects now that are aware that they need to be aware of the environment mm -hmm. as they do their design. But one of the, ch and there's goodwill in some of those um, architects. There are not very many, unfortunately, in Kenya that are um, observing nature mm -hmm. as they do their design. Mm -hmm. But there's few that do that. However, one of the big challenges also is um, awareness of the community and um, even the developers, because those people are not aware of nature per se. So they don't even know that what you might be designing has, might have a negative impact um, on their lives until something's built and you realize, oh, um, this was built on top of a river. Unfortunately, that does happen in Kenya because we are a corrupt nation. <laughs> but, um, and just recently, there's a building that was um, pulled down because it was built on top of a river. Everybody knew it was being done on top of a river, um, but because you pay city officials, they turn a blind eye, and the building goes on. And then what happens is when it rains, the river needs to go somewhere. Right. <laughs> yeah, but you've put this uh, building in front of me. So I'm going to find, um, you know, the river is going to find its own path, its own course. And that's the negative impact then it has on mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, but slowly, because of this awareness and a lot of buildings that are being pulled down now, people are aware, are starting to become aware of what um, needs to be done correctly, because we must respect nature. We are using nature, we are borrowing from nature, so at the end of the day, we really do need to observe it. We can't ignore it. We can't go against nature. Because if you do go against nature, it will come back 10 times worse mm -hmm. <laughs> on you. So um, <clears throat> we are not probably where the West might be in terms of uh, being aware of nature in your design. But I think we are sort of getting there. I don't know if we're necessarily the, <laughs> the West is the role model. <laughs> but. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's like I, um, it seems like there's a whole nother kind of new system that we should be sort of striving for. Um, I think we can be over too many requirements and, you know, um, so it's, I know there's, you know, issues there, but I think we have other issues here. What were you going to say? Yeah. I, um, I, I was trying to, to explain before uh, uh, what you mentioned, you know, this connection mm -hmm. that uh, we have to have with nature you know, and how architecture role plays. Um, we, we have to remember that we humans are nature also. Yeah. And, uh, and architecture has to connect with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes as, uh, architecture has been 
silent to ourselves, mm -hmm. making our own spaces and systems soulless to ourselves, not connecting to ourselves, not really, really serving mm -hmm. to uh, the main purpose of sheltering, no? of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of being part as a as an extension of, of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So um, part of uh, what Ensemble has been doing in the, its research, and I think that this installation is, is a, a shot of this uh, intention, is trying to, to make this kind of deep, um, I would say emotional connection to, a, to matter that ultimately is what architecture provides, you know, this kind of <coughs> transformation in in, into uh, of matter into something that serves and connects spiritually. Um, I always uh, make this comparison with the art world, where uh, art has been able to evolve and transform culturally. Mm -hmm. uh, the last big, well, maybe not the last, the mo but. The, the, one of the most intense moments culturally of this city uh, leading uh, the art world was in the 50s through the mm -hmm. abstract expressionisms where all these artists connected with nature, with mm -hmm. their own human soul nature to break all the pre-existing disciplinary rules of, of art mm -hmm. and trying to uh, re recreate them. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the lines or the geometries became strokes and stains. Suddenly the forms and shapes became maps and, and fields. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and now, uh, almost uh, more than half a century after, that's part of our culture, it's part of our, I would say, a spiritual connection to, to, uh, to, to the abstractness of, of art. And uh, architecture has not yet arrived to that. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the, f the source is the same. Mm -hmm. uh, the same way the abstract expressionist looked uh, uh, to some aspects of nature no? mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to recode everything mm -hmm. and transform culturally uh, the society. Uh, I think architecture is not yet there yet. No? Mm -hmm. We are still. I would say we are still in the 30s, mm -hmm. yeah? <laughs> in a, in a post-cubism, figurativism, uh -huh. playfulness, colorfulness, you know, um, thing. And, uh, and we have not yet found the language, the tectonics, and, uh, and the forms that could connect our human soul mm -hmm. to nature through space. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that uh, I, I've just admired of your work in a, in a very kind of analytical way and in a completely different way, but I think following a similar right. path, yeah. we, we, are, we are trying to, um, to find that, that, that language, that tectonics, that materiality, and that, that expression to connect yes, with nature. Thank you. Okay. Maybe just to add yeah. on that briefly, because um, uh, within our industry, we're in a huge dilemma uh, we are responsible for probably the most pollution, the most consumption of resources. And as architects, we're at the helm of that. And some of us, yes, we reflect on it more deeply than others, mm -hmm. but we are still burdened with that immense power of creating a situation where we're destroying systems on the planet, depleting its resources, and perpetuating sort of gross growth mm -hmm. of economies uh, in a really negative way. You know, I mean, you just have to just look around and realize we're really messing up. And us four in front of you, actually, we're at the helm of doing that. Mm -hmm. And I guess in a way what we're questioning is how should we continue, mm -hmm. you know? Our reflections on material, and we also love the work you guys do, reflections of how you build and respond to nature, respond to the process, actually being part builder, part <laughs> uh, conceiver, um, are vital. And in a way, we're, we're sort of going through huge pains um, to come out of, as you said, this sort of baggage of how you produce architecture. 
-hmm. to be in a space where we can almost arguably say we need to actually go back and reverse a lot of these impacts. And so part of what we're talking about is saying a return to the cave to, to literally almost return to the cave. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do it consciously, it will be done for us by nature. Yep. And in, in an interesting light, there's some poetry in that, mm -hmm. um, but also some really hard truths mm -hmm. of where we're actually taking ourselves. Um, so yeah, it's a complex space we're in. <laughs> OK. Thank you. I wish we could continue this, but I'm going to throw it open to the Q&A. And remember, there's a prize for the best answer. And Kara, <laughs> one question? Maybe. No, no. We ha OK. Kara, you're going to have to decide. I'm not deciding who has the best question. OK. Um, hello. My question's for all the open to all the panelists, but particularly in CAVE, because what has was said in the presentation, like I hear about channeling the past. I hear about, like, thinking back to the ancestors and how art has transformative pow transformative powers, especially particularly that your projects are essentially interactive art. Thing is that what what have you noticed in terms of respo response from the public, particularly in children, how how they are interacting with your projects because they're learning they're learning to tap into their internal nature and learning about the past. But is there any way to to do like to explore how your projects are influencing viewpoints, it's like from the from the youngest to the oldest, and how your work is inf is shaping communities and neighborhoods, and how they're going to re react to nature in the future. Um, I'll, I'll just partly answer that. Maybe I won't fully. Um, kids are complex beings, <laughs> but. <laughs> And that's their gift, in a way. <laughs> um, but what's great is when you see children in nature, in space, they just feel natural. It's like, yeah, this is where I belong. This is where I'm free, you know? And we are trying to tap into that. When you take kids to caves, it's a mix of fear, intrigue, and, you know, this is where I want to be, you know, and they have memories that ingrain and everything. And so, at least for us, we're trying to tap into that space. Um, and unfortunately, within our industry, it's almost trying to get that childish appreciation back to it, where we really um, look at these simple experiences of echoes, of darkness, of vulnerability, and, uh, you know, liberation, back to, it's almost that childishness that we need, um, and for us, what we try to do, at least with at least our own children, is literally take them into, into those spaces uh, and help them relive that. Um, and not disconnect how a kid experiences with what we experience, almost say that there should be a shared um, experience of nature in that manner. And so we're bringing back ourselves into that space um, because, yeah, we're all kids in a way. I don't know if that answers it. Thank you very much. Really great evening. Um, what do you think large developers in urban centers can learn from your work, or you would hope they would learn from your work? Thank you. I wish I would know that one. <laughs> uh, well, um, <laughs> um, hmm. you know, uh, there was a Spanish architect that has a beautiful quote I'm trying to translate. I said, architecture is either popular or intellectual. Everything in the middle is just business. <laughs> okay. So how to connect business with the popular, uh, the intellectual and landscape? That's... That's the, I mean, that's the magic triangle. I think nobody has done. Um, nobody that I know of. Um, because the business has its own set of rules, its own timing. And, uh, but I'm very, very optimistic that as soon as uh, the human and market uh, desires and trends 
follow what we've been discussing, there will be a path that will be already uh, traced. No? How to trace it is the challenge, and we are all working on it. Uh, it has to, has to start with an ethical position. I think we're pretty close as a society, even though we, I think a lot has been changed in the last decade. And as a society, we have at least the impulse or the inertia not to go against what we are doing and to look forward in a, in a clear path, in the, uh, I would say, an horizon. No? Uh, in terms of architecture, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to honor all these aspects uh, with, uh, with design, even though there's, there's the technology and there's the, the craft and there's the professionals and there's the attitude to, to fulfill it. No? But, uh, yeah. yeah. We don't know, because every time we do this kind of work, we look at each other and we say, like, we've ruined our career. Yeah. No? Because, I mean, as architects, we want to make projects that have an impact in society. We want to be making those spaces that people inhabit in their everyday life and that, you know, inspire them and uh, make their life better. But unfortunately, we're not the kind of architects building all the buildings that, you know, are, um, um, you know, are, are filling you know, the cities and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, we, we, we really believe that we would do an amazing job, no? But, you know, it's, it's this difficult cycle that we are optimistic, like, we, we really think that there's a, a space uh, for us that we are fighting for. Who is the brave developer that will trust those who are actually trying to get things done differently? You know, there might be some. I, I'm, I'm positive that there are probably the, the, some. The good news is that uh, real estate <laughs> and developer industry that you mentioned, it's completely obsolete. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's the only, it's the last maybe industry, by the way, it moves almost a third of the wealth uh, of, of, of humanity and accumulates it. Uh, and, but we still do buildings pretty much like uh, the Renaissance, no? like putting parts together in a side, crafting it. I mean, there's, there's no, there's no uh, technological improvement enough uh, in, the, in the process of building a building that could be a, a really, really, um, let's say, um, technological uh, advancement yet. Okay, so that's the, that's the good news. That uh, I think technology will help to achieve this uh, mission. Unfortunately, we're going to have to end the discussion at least formally. You can certainly come up and ask questions afterwards, but. Thank you, Ensemble and Kay, for a credible discussion and presentation. And thank you all for being here. And please go up and see the exhibition another time. <laughs>